you're um, in the medical field? Is that, I'm a nurse. You're a nurse? Okay. But I'm a cardiology nurse. I know hearts, but... Yeah. Is it stout? Stouty. Stouty? Okay. Because you're the one, the one, no one. I just want to see you strike cards. <laughs> Family is supposed to be there for you during the highs and lows of your life. We have been following the Stouty family for three years now, and tonight we are finally showing the details of why. They are people who you should be able to trust and really let your guard down with. But as we know, that isn't always the case. Inside of a Green County courtroom, as Rachel Stouty read in a statement, so what happens when your family members turn against you in secret? quietly plotting your death. All while you are sitting across the hall in your bedroom, scrolling on your phone, thinking everything is just normal within your family. It's hard to imagine, right? Hard to imagine, right? Do you find yourself wondering how you wound up here? This is a family that will truly haunt your nightmares. This is Dark Chapters. Springfield, Missouri is a fairly large town with a population of 170,000 people. But even with it being on the bigger side, it still has all of the charm that the Midwest is known for. It's also a college town, home of Missouri State University. Now, something many people in Springfield do is attend church on Sunday mornings, which really should come as no surprise because Springfield is considered kind of like in the buckle of the Bible Belt because of its Evangelical Christian Association. And on one Easter Sunday on April 8th, 2012, one member of the Redeemer Lutheran Church was not present in that congregation, and it was 61-year-old Mark Stoudy. You saw Mark that Friday before Easter. Right. What was he like? Well, at, we were doing a recording session. We never got the recording done because he was just so out of whack. And I'm like, Mark, come on, we're trying to do a recording here. It didn't even click to him that we were trying to record. One thing struck me so out of place, his skin color. His skin was actually a, a yellowish color. Something was wrong with him. That was the last time I seen him. Now, Mark and his family were regular church members at this location, and his wife, 50-year-old Diane, was the church's organist. Now, there was nothing seemingly too out of the ordinary about the Stouty family. Mark and Diane had a story typical to many married Midwestern couples. Mark was from St. Louis, and Diane was from Springfield, and the two of them met in 1984 at a bluegrass music festival. They immediately bonded over their passion for music, and they fell in love. They got married on December 28, 1985, and and then they decided to settle down in Diane's hometown of Springfield. Now, when they got married, Diane was already pregnant three months along with their first child. And while it was never confirmed, it was rumored that due to the quick arrival of their baby, that's what led to such a fast wedding. But either way, Mark and Diane were excited to get married and create a future together. Sometimes you know, everybody kind of reaches a, a tipping point or a breaking point and gets gets to where, you know, like, even like I said, that maybe certain decisions are made that normally wouldn't be made for that. I think you're aware of, of why, we're just, why we're here. So the couple had their 26-year-old son named Sean the following year on July 2nd, 1986. And things were good for this new family. So two years later, they welcomed a baby girl named Sarah. And then two years after that, they had their third child, Rachel. The family grew quick, but they were a happy bunch. And then their family was completed 13 years later when Brianna was born. What was mom and dad's relationship like? They would fight a little. Did they fight a little bit? 
Were they close? I think so. You think they were close, but they did have disagreements and stuff. Once in a while. And your mom's a nurse, right? Yeah. Diane was trained as a nurse, and she worked full-time in the health insurance industry. She was the breadwinner for this big family, which brought on a lot of stress in the marriage. Every now and then, Mark, he would go out and bartend, but his passion was really music, and he was in a band called Messing With the Destiny, and he was the singer and the guitarist. But as most small town blues bands go, Mark didn't exactly bring in the big bucks with these gigs that his band got. It was more of a hobby, so to speak. So he primarily took care of raising all four of the kids, but apparently that didn't really include doing much around the house. And people who knew him actually kind of said that he was a little bit of a slob. He took care of the kids, but really nothing else. Else. Not the dishes, not the laundry, nothing that really goes into keeping a house clean and together. So this left Diane to pick up a lot of the slack. Now, although three of their kids were adults at this point, most of them still needed a lot of extra attention. See, 26-year-old Sean was their oldest child, and he was on the autism spectrum and lived at home with his family. 24-year-old Sarah went to college, but she ended up back at home to save money after graduating with a ton of student debt. And nine-year-old Brianna had learning disabilities as well. And then there was 22-year-old Rachel, and Rachel was considered Diane's golden child. She was very close with her mom, and she also helped out in the church's music program, so they they really bonded over everything together. Rachel was the only sibling who really loved going to church and who even willingly went on a regular basis. Nobody else was very interested in it. That Easter Sunday, Mark's friends were worried when he wasn't at church. But Diane said that he was fine, he was just at home not feeling very well. But in reality, it wasn't just a matter of him being under the weather. His bandmates were noticing that Mark was not acting normal at all. And on top of that, his skin was yellow and his words were slurred. And then the week leading up to that Easter Sunday, their son Sean posted a slew of bizarre Facebook posts about his dad's ever-changing behavior. This started on April 1st, 2012 when he said, my dad is suffering from an incurable mental illness and is likely to die. And Sean's post got increasingly more outlandish as the days went on. So on a post on April 6th, it read, my father has changed from panic, aggressive, and selfish to depressed and suicidal. He took his car, wallet, and cell phone. He said he would off himself rather than torment us. I don't know if I will see him alive. He no longer cares about himself. He never truly listened to other people. If he is dead, I want to see him to make sure that he is dead. So like I said, this wasn't just a cold or being under the weather that Mark was dealing with. There was something way more serious going on and seemingly mentally distressing that Mark was going through. And all these people in Mark's life were very, very worried about him. Something's just not sitting right. So the next day before everyone knew it, Diane posted to Facebook that Mark had actually passed away on Easter the night before. She said, for all my friends on Facebook, this past Sunday evening, Mark, my husband of 27 years, reached his eternal home. And she posted a Bible verse with it. So this shocked everybody because just the day before, Diane was telling people at church, no, 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 he's just at home with a cold. He's a little under the weather. Meanwhile, the bandmates were like, well, he's kind of been weird for the last like week. His skin was yellow, his speech was slurred. Clearly something else is going on, right? And now she's announcing to the world, Mark died the night before. So what was really going on here? So when Diane talked to police, she told them that Mark hadn't been feeling well for the past week. And that even though she tried to get him to go and see a doctor, he didn't want to. And to add even more suspicion to the situation, Mark's body was found with a ring of blood around his mouth. So what would have caused that? Mark had a lot of weird friends. Well, I don't know if I'd call them friends. Acquaintances. He, he would binge drink and he was running around and he would smoke pot and you know, they were into drugs and all that, but, you know, I had friends who told me I should kick them out, but I couldn't find myself kicking them out. I was afraid he'd kill himself. Even with all the spells, I still loved him.
Now, Mark wasn't known to live the healthiest of lifestyles, which included a pretty regular amount of alcohol and not the healthiest diet. So his death wasn't actually investigated much because people just thought, okay, he was unhealthy. He was sick leading up to the days he died. His death must have been natural causes. And that's what it was ruled at. It was ruled to be natural causes. So Mark's body was cremated and his ashes were spread over Lake Springfield. Diane ended up receiving $20,000 in life insurance for Mark's death, and she decided to move her four children into a house a little bit bigger than the home that her and Mark had raised their family in. Now, the new home was in the same town, so there wasn't much of an upheaval for the family since it was a local move, but still seemed a bit strange, right? Love can rise from the ashes of Things seemed to be going as well as they could for the family in the months after Mark's death. Diane and Rachel were continuing to play a large role in their church's music ministry, and the family wasn't nearly as cramped as they were in their old house. It was also back to school time for the youngest sibling, Brianna. But things quickly and drastically changed for the family on Sunday, September 2nd, 2012, just five months after Mark's very mysterious death. How old was your brother? Six? His name Something was Sean. Like Sean. Yeah. Was he living at home? Yeah. He, he, had he been living at home all the time? Yeah. So he's never moved out on his own at 26. No. Or, what was wrong with him? Did he have some kind of a physical um, he had a, disabilities? Or? Um, autism. Um, he had a seizure disorder thing. Okay. So he couldn't work, I assume, then. He did do Springfoot workshop for a time, workshop. but he was having some like. Not behavioral problem, but just some issue with coworkers. Oh, he would just get frazzled. Very well. Yeah, okay. easily overwhelmed. Was your mom pretty much the caregiver for him then? I assume. Yeah. Police officers were called to the Stouty residence because Sean was found not breathing. Diane had gone to church that morning without Sean, and when she got back around 12.30 p.m., she found him lying on the floor with a blanket over his stomach and no pulse. So after the police arrived, she told them that for the last few weeks, Sean was pretty sick. It was almost as if he had the flu or something. He had headaches, nausea, diarrhea, body aches, basically all of your typical flu-like symptoms. But she said that she didn't take him to the hospital because he was staying hydrated the entire time, so she wasn't that worried. She said the night before church, she talked to Sean, and he said that he was sick, so she checked on him throughout the night, but still went to church that morning, thinking he was just gonna get it out of his system. Now, it's interesting to note that when Mark was pretty sick, Diane also still went to church not seeming that worried. And now the exact same thing happened with her son. Is that a coincidence? We all say where there's smoke, there's fire, right? Well, here's another coincidence for you. There was also a dried ring of blood around Sean's mouth. Mm. Now it's a little too close for comfort. Something ain't smelling right here. Two people in your family die, the same ring of blood around their mouth, same ill-like symptoms leading up to it. What's really going on here? So when he passed in like September or so, what was the circumstances behind that? Was it a sudden thing or do you know that much about why he passed or did you hear the medical reasons behind it? I remember he was throwing up. How many days did he throw up? Mm, less than a week. Okay, and um, like flu-like symptoms or something yeah, along those then, lines? Okay. Who was caring for him at that point when he was down sick? Was it we were taking turns, taking turns pretty much. Cause Okay. You and mom? Yeah. Okay. So he would think that it's suspicious enough, right? And that an investigation would happen. Well, the medical examiner ruled Sean's death the result of prior medical issues. Diane had told the police that Sean had a history of seizures, and one being most recent, just a few days before he died. So Sean's body was also cremated, just like his father's. And Diane once again took to Facebook, again, two days after he died, to let her family and friends know about his death. In this post, she said, to my Facebook friends and family, it's been hard for me to come up with the right words, but here it goes. On Sunday, my oldest child, Sean, died. Although he had been sick lately, we thought that he was getting better. Thank you to those who have called or messaged me. Please continue to pray for us during this time. And while some of her posts afterwards on Facebook were scriptures, which I guess is typical and understandable when somebody is in mourning, a lot of her stuff kind of just came off, quite frankly, bizarre. 
It was a bizarre thing to post so soon after going through such a devastating loss. For example, just a week after Sean's death, she posted a meme about pie. And then that same day, she made a Happy Monday post about coffee. Now, it seems a little strange to me, at least, to be posting things like that so shortly after walking in to find her son dead months after she found her husband dead. Obviously, life goes on and people do what others would maybe call strange things during grief, but Diane's behavior just seemed, I don't know, a little out there. So after Sean died, Diane was left with just her and her three daughters, and Rachel ended up moving into Sean's bedroom. Diane was busy as ever with her job, her church duties, and life in general, and it just she kind of just seemed to continue to chug along and get back to normal and get the whole family and the new family of just the stouty women back into this new routine. That was until June 9th, 2013, nine months after Sean's death, when Diane posted to Facebook once again, this time asking asking for prayers for her daughter, Sarah, because Sarah was now in critical condition in the ICU. Now, Sarah was 24 years old at that time, and she went into the hospital with, what do you know, flu-like symptoms. Sounds familiar, right? But the doctors on her case couldn't figure out what was wrong with her. It turned out that her brain was bleeding and her kidneys were failing. Still, doctors were stumped as to what was really going on with an otherwise healthy young woman, so Sarah spent 10 days in the ICU. She was finally able to walk again, but still was stuck in the hospital while doctors were trying to figure out what was going on with her. She was literally the sickest 24-year-old that the doctors had ever seen, yet there were no indications as to why. Little did anyone know that someone had made an anonymous call to the Springfield Police Department. And on that call, they were saying that something seemed to be off with a family that he knew. He said that two family members died from what looked to be the same suspicious and mysterious death. And now another member of that same family is literally fighting for their life with the exact same symptoms. And that tipster that police found out later just so happened to be Diane's pastor, Jeff Sippy, who Diane was pretty close with. From the time when Mark died, Jeff was really suspicious about everything. He didn't think that Mark's death was natural in any way. And then when things started happening with all of the kids, his alarm bells really started going off. Springfield detective Neil McAmis decided to look into the tip from Pastor Jeff, and he went to the hospital that Sarah was staying at. When he got there, the doctor on Sarah's case told him that he thought one strong possibility that Sarah was dealing with was some type of poisoning. The doctor said that Sarah wasn't going to make it and that she was literally on death's doorstep. One of Sarah's nurses also spoke with the detective and told him that Diane was acting really bizarre, especially being that her daughter was dying right before her eyes. Again, kind of eerily similar to her unusual Facebook posts right after Sean's death. It's almost as if she didn't really care, like she was going in for a routine appointment, not seeing how severe this really was. And get this, she also was talking to the staff about a vacation to Florida that she had coming up. And she was even making jokes about Sarah's declining health. I mean, how sick is that? All right. Is it stout? Stouty. Stouty? Okay. Diane was then called into question by Neil, and he asked about the possibility of Sarah possibly harming herself by maybe ingesting poison of some type. And when he asked Diane what type of cleaning product she had at home, her response was so strange and even included her laughing at one point. What kind of cleaners do you think it could have been that she would have? What do I have? I can't see her taking soap. <laughs> Yuck. Um. The general, you know, everyday cleaner. Well, I have some of that. What's, what would that be? Um, what's the name of it? Lysol. Okay. I know I have that, but... I don't... Could you, could you even hurt yourself from soap or Lysol, do you know? I'm not... I have no clue. No, okay. <laughs> I, I don't even think about... Right. I've just like never that. heard of anything like that, so I... I haven't either. It's like, but I, I guess... I don't know. I guess if you took enough, something would do something, mm -hmm. but I've never, I don't know. Okay. 
The detective goes on to talk about how they were planning on going through both her husband and Sean's autopsy again so that they could run more tests to see if there were any similarities or anything that was missed. And they asked if there was anything nefarious that could come out of that new report. And Diane played very coy about all of it. She was then asked about the life insurance policy on her family members. And I found her response kind of odd. What was Mark's life insurance policy like? He only had 20000 that was it. Okay. How about Sean? Sean only had fifteen. What about Sarah? Sarah only has fifteen, I believe. And Rachel? And Rachel has fifteen. And Brianna? Has fifteen. Okay. You were able to get the, the money from Mark and Sean's, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. It took a while, but, so, yeah, but finally. You didn't, right. And what did you do with, with that money? Um, with Mark's, we were able to move into a better neighborhood. Right. How about Sean's? With Sean's, I haven't even... Right now, it's still in savings because I haven't quite figured out what to do yet. Okay. With some of it. What were your plans? Some things are, I'm thinking more of just paying off bills. Okay. What about Sarah's? If she passed, what was going to... I have no clue. Now, I don't know. I just thought that it was strange that she knew everybody's life insurance policy right off the top of her head and how she didn't even seem the least bit distraught about cashing out on them. You'd think that when asked about Sarah's, she would say something like, oh my gosh, I certainly haven't thought about that and I hope I never even have to. But Diane went on to talk about how she didn't really think much of Mark's death due to his lifestyle. The detective then asked her about her marriage, which she painted out to be pretty bad overall. What was your his marriage like? Um, how can I say this? We were still married, but it was not what you call a good marriage. Mm -hmm. Had there been any infidelities on either side? He had. He had. So I'm guessing then just briefly thought he wasn't the best husband? Mm, probably not. Okay. Not not to society, no. What do you mean by that, not to society? Well, he was running around and he would drink and smoke pot and... So he wasn't a very good guy is what not, you're saying? Yeah. I know, you know, I've had friends who told me I should kick him out, but I couldn't find myself kicking him out. Why not? I was afraid he'd kill himself. Why is that though? Why would he kill himself? Oh, he was bipolar too. And even though things were bad and he wasn't a good husband and you said he wasn't good for society, that you didn't want him to kill himself? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, even with all his faults, I still loved him. She said that when Mark was alive, he didn't bring in the financial support that she had hoped for, and instead he would just play music. She also talked about how her son, Sean, needed a lot of extra care due to his autism. And then she discussed how Sarah basically didn't do anything but sleep all day and just hang out with her friends at night. Diane wanted her to get a job, but Sarah didn't prioritize that. 
Little did Diane know that Neil knew all along that the test results of both Mark and Sean's autopsy had come back as a huge red flag. He had just been trying to get Diane to give him the truth and admit to her role in all of it. So Neil decided to go about a religious approach to all of this so that he could get Diane to confess to what he already knew, knowing how much she values religion. So he was saying how he knows how important it is to her that he himself is also a man of God. He talked about forgiveness is an important factor with all of this stuff and kind of just like starts to warm Diane up a bit so that she would tell a little bit more about the story. Let's talk about it because I think, I think you, you probably want to talk about it. You need to talk about it because, you know, you know when, when people, you know, do things, it's always good to ask for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. You know that. And oftentimes the best way to ask for forgiveness is to to talk about it and give an explanation as to why things happen. As far as... Um, Sarah's a difficult child mm -hmm. to deal with. I understand. And I've been kind of putting pressure on her to, you know, you need to get out and get a job. Your college bills are coming due. I don't want to pay for them. I, you know, after all, you get tired of doing everything for your kids, and it's like you need to step up and do it. But as far as Did I do something to or I didn't do anything to her? I mean, I, I guess I could have taken her to the ER sooner, but I didn't know. Diane still wasn't wanting to budge. She was sticking to her guns that she had no idea how her daughter, husband, and son all got into the predicament that they did. But again, Neil was not having it. He knew that she was hiding something. So he took the understanding approach where he acted like a friend to her. Diane, here's the deal. I'm here to try to help you out with all this. Because I know. Because I need all the help I can. I, I understand. I understand. I, I really do. And I know that this is, I know because you're a good person, I know that this is tearing you up, that this is bothering you. I truly understand that, but I'm here to help you out because I know that you don't want, because of you being a good person, you don't want everybody out here when this all mm -hmm. comes out. You don't want them to, to think of you as a bad, evil type person mm -hmm. because I know that that's not how you are, but with, um, that's why I'm here to try to help you out, to give you the opportunity to, to say, because I think I know. I think I know why, and it's for some of the reasons we've already talked about. If I think it's just pushed to the brink, can't take it anymore. You know, you're doing all this stuff for everybody. You're working all the time. You're paying the bills. You're doing this. You're doing that. You can't get help. No jobs. You got all this other stuff. All these other burdens coming upon you. Where all of us get to a point where we just say, you know, enough is enough. And I understand that. I understand that. But you've got to, you've got to help me figure out. You got to tell me this stuff. You got to tell me why. That way we can get to that point. That's way when we can get it out there that you know what this isn't just about somebody that's bad and evil. You you want people to know that it's that's not what it is. It just gets to the point, Diane. Mean, it's just it's just the breaking point. All of us, every one of us, have it. That, that's it's it's just as simple as that, Diane. It just we all have that. It just we get right there, and then I mean, all the burdens that you have to have on you. You know that I know that, and that's what I'm giving you the chance, Diane. That's why we're here today, is so you can tell me, so you can tell me, so we can get it all on the table. It'll be that weight that'll be lifted off your shoulders, because I know people that care, especially good people like yourself. 
that walk around and carry this kind of stuff, carry these kind of burdens. Um, so many times just talking about it to get it out there and say, here's the deal. I did this because because I had all this going and then it'll just it'll be a relief to be able to talk about it, to get it off your shoulders and then to help with the forgiveness and the healing process. But you have to you have to do it. That's why I'm here. You have to sit down just like we're doing and talk about it and get it all out there. You do know I'm that. Afraid you do. Know, jail. I know. I know. I know you're afraid of going to jail, but that's that. You shouldn't even be thinking about that right now. I know, but that's how my mind works. I understand. I understand, but let's put that out of your mind because you shouldn't even be thinking about that. Okay. I understand you're afraid to go to jail. Well, we're not going to even think about that because that's got nothing to do with it. Now is your chance to to tell us why and and to show some remorse and ask for forgiveness, and that way I can go to these other people and say, yeah. She made some mistakes and that was it. So tell me about it, Diane. There's a lot of arguments. And to put it really short and sweet, I knew they were drinking antifreeze. And I was so mad at him, I didn't want to take him in. I delayed. Who out there really is willingly drinking antifreeze, especially three people in all different ages in one family. Now, apparently drinking antifreeze is something that alcoholics are sometimes known to do, but that's typically when they have very limited resources. It's also something people do as a means to end their lives, but neither Mark nor his family had limited resources. And even if they didn't have a lot of money, I definitely don't think they were getting to the point of needing to drink antifreeze. Not to mention that Mark was known to drink regularly, so he was already getting those needs met with actual alcohol. And Sean and Sarah weren't alcoholics. I'm not necessarily sure that they even drank at all. So something here just was not adding up. And like I said, Neil already knew that antifreeze was the culprit because when both Mark and Sean's autopsies were looked into a second time, ethylene glycol was present in each of them, which is a raw component of antifreeze. And it's often overlooked during autopsies unless the medical examiner knows to look for it. So Neil could see right through Diane's bullshit. The math was not math in here and he knew it. You knew that they were drinking antifreeze. Mm -hmm. You knew that. They didn't. We both know that. You knew, Diane, that they were drinking antifreeze because you were giving it to them. like we talked, were you just at the breaking point? Yeah. I didn't know what else to do. Finally, Neil had his admission of guilt that he needed to have Diane arrested. So as he was running down exactly what happened, Diane's body language completely shifted. Again, this all got started. You're saying Mark is the first one. There's nobody before Mark, not in your past life or not in, okay, Mark's the first one. And it just got started. You said you hated his guts and- I just you couldn't take it Couldn't anymore. take it anymore. And so you did some research on the internet about antifreeze poisoning. You were aware of, you know, the taste and things of that nature, like you said. Then you ordered, some antifreeze and then you, you gave it to him for a few, <coughs> few days before it finally started to kick in and work okay and then with Sh with sean you said you just again we talked about he just became such a pest and bothering you always interfering things of that nature and um 
you said it took a couple days, right? A couple before it started to kick in on him. And then with Sarah, you talked about, you know, she, she wasn't getting a job and then she had these student loans and you were going to end up having to pay for them. She wasn't working. You said you guys argued a lot. Was there anything else more or is that pretty much? That's pretty much. And you just had had it with her as well. Okay. And then you said it took about four days before it started to work on her. Okay. And there's, you didn't use anything, just antifreeze. There's nothing else at all. A few hours after Diane was arrested, it was time for the authorities to let her other daughter, Rachel, know about what her mom had done to her dad, brother, and sister, all while keeping the investigation going. Now, Rachel and her mom were very close, remember, best friends, actually. Diane favored Rachel for unknown reasons. One could assume maybe because Rachel had a passion for music just like her mom did, and she must have kind of seen more of herself in Rachel than her other kids. During the questioning with Neil, Diane didn't have anything negative to say about Rachel, unlike her other kids and even her husband, who she loathed. Diane would often showcase Rachel on her Facebook too, far more than her other kids. In fact, her son was actually nowhere to be found on her page at all. She considered Rachel to be musically gifted, and someone that she could confide in. And Rachel felt the same way about her mom. So I'm sure you may be thinking how shocked she must have been learning about who her mom really was and what she had done. But before the detective told her about what he knew regarding her mom, he asked Rachel about what life at home had been like since her dad and brother passed and how her mom viewed taking care of her brother while he was still alive. And Rachel said that her mom took her brother's death extra hard and considered herself pretty much a failure as a mother. And Rachel painted quite a different picture of her brother than what her mom did, being that she referred to her own son as being worse than a pest at one point. But Rachel said that her brother was actually pretty easygoing and basically only needed a few comic books to stay happy, and that overall, he wasn't much of a burden to the family. But on the other hand, Rachel seemed to be more bothered by her sister, Sarah. She said that her sister basically just goofed off and didn't even try when it came to getting a job. She also kind of poked fun at the fact that Sarah got a degree in French at Missouri State that past fall and how she was going to have a really tough time finding a French job in Springfield. Rachel also didn't seem very distraught that her sister was just about to die only a couple of days prior. So the detective finally told Rachel about what her mother had done with the antifreeze and Rachel seemed kind of shocked, but not really all that reactive. So I uh, brought your mom in today and talked to her and um, after talking to her for a while, she um, she finally told us what she had been doing. Um, she had been giving your father uh, small doses of, anti of antifreeze in his drinks um, over a several period, over several day period. Um, same thing with your brother, and uh, same thing with your sister Sarah. Um, I know it's very difficult and obviously we don't think that you or your sister had any knowledge obviously of that um, your mom is is um, obviously she's torn up over the whole thing and, and mentally she's she's beat herself up over it I'm sure every day and like you even said she she's an emotional wreck at home um, her reasonings for doing this to your father basically was that uh, just had enough of him he was, as she described it, just not carrying his way, not being a good father, not being a good husband. Um, you know, there was some infidelity stuff going on in there. There was some drug use going on in there. And she finally just got to the point where she couldn't deal with him any longer. And then unfortunately, um, after that, it, that, that kind of same type scenario kind of this is the reason she describes for for giving she started giving your brother um, antifreeze in coke and soda over a couple of day period um, and then unfortunately um, your sister same situation giving her antifreeze over a two or three day period um, small bits of it at a time in her in her in her drinks in her coke um, basically she says because wouldn't get a job, wasn't doing anything, um, felt like she was going down the same path as a brother and dad and was just gonna be this complete burden to her and the family. And um, that's basically the reason, that's, that's what she's giving us is her reason for doing this. Um, 
I know that's a lot to take in right now, Rachel. That's a ton to take in. And I don't by any means think you know anything about it or were involved. Mom tells us that you and you didn't have any idea at all. Um, I assume that's the case, right? Did you even have any suspicions that mom was doing anything? I mean, I know in the back of your mind you said you didn't like to think about it, but these things, you know, yours were kind of just all of a sudden death. Just take some time and... A lot to process. I don't even know how you how you actually process that. To be honest with you, Rachel. But once the detective stepped out of the room, Rachel broke down, pleading to God about what she had just been told. Investigators combed through the Stouty home, finding various pieces of evidence, such as antifreeze in the garage. But then they stumbled onto something pretty shocking, Rachel's journal, and a bone-chilling entry from her diary that was dated on June 13th, 2011, around a year before Mark's death. Now, in this entry, it said, I wish sometimes I could avoid the future and keep looking to the past. It's sad when I realize how my father will pass on in the next two months and how my brother Sean will move on shortly after. And yet it's really helpful. I'm being warned so I have more time to prepare and cope. Also, I get to have dad's car when he's gone. It'll be tough getting used to the changes, but everything will work out. Uh... How disturbing and twisted is that? She was excited to get her dad's car after he was going to be killed and die, and she's glad that she had time to prepare. I mean, what is even happening and how are you, you know, do you have a crystal ball? How do you predict the future? How do you know both your dad and your brother are about to die in the next year? Like, make it make sense. So the next day, after Rachel was told about her mother, she was called back in to speak with Neil about the investigation. Now, Rachel had no idea that the detective knew about her creepy ass journal entry. So he wanted to ease into that as much as he could so that he could just kind of like squeeze as much information out of her as possible and not allow her to claim innocence to the diary entry. So he he asked about the kind of drinks that her dad and her brother liked, knowing of course that Diane had admitted to spiking her husband's Gatorade and her son's Coke over the course of several days. And for both her dad and her brother, Rachel listed about every other drink on the planet except the drinks that were used. Rachel acted a lot like her mom during the questioning too, acting like she had no idea what had been going on. She said that it was her decision to take Sarah to the hospital because at that point, Sarah was lying on the bathroom floor, not moving or talking. Neil asked if there was any indication prior to her dad dying that he would die, and she said no, only that her mom had talked about how if he kept up with the smoking and the alcohol, he probably wouldn't make it to 80 or 90 years old. But otherwise, she didn't know of him having any sort of terminal health condition whatsoever. So when Neil had gotten Rachel to a point where there was no way for her to deny what he found in the journal, he decided that it was time to present her with it. But what would her excuse be upon being confronted? Well, apparently it was a dream. Do you recognize this? Yeah, I remember this. Okay, what is that? little journal thing. A journal thing? Whose journal? Mine. Your journal? So you wrote this then, is what you're telling mm -hmm. me? Okay. You remember writing this then, is what you're saying? Uh -huh. Okay. Let's take a look at this. Is that your same journal that we were just talking about that you were writing? was a dream that I had had that they would die but this is your journal yeah you wrote this mm. and you remember writing it yeah 
Okay. At first, Rachel acted as if she had been having reoccurring dreams about her parents dying. She said that she told her mom about them and that in her dreams, their death would be quick and that they would be in heaven very, very fast. But then all of a sudden, she says that she didn't know when her mom bought antifreeze, but that she knew that she was spiking her dad's drinks. So then Neil asked Rachel if the mother-daughter duo came up with a plan together or if this was all her mom's idea. And Rachel claimed that it was her mom's idea and that she herself was pretty uncomfortable with all of it. Rachel, whose idea was this? Mom brought it up, I mean, and then we discussed, but... So you and Mom are close enough. You guys are, just like we talked about earlier, you guys are best, you know, close enough friends and, you know, mother-daughter that you guys have a tight enough bond that you guys could discuss this. Mm -hmm. And she was the one to bring it up? Yeah. What did she say to you? Um, basically went through different options, um, was trying to find things that wouldn't be traceable or at least would be hard to trace if you didn't know what you were looking for. Um, I remember her searching online though, I remember talking about different drinks that I could mix with and you couldn't detect taste um, what kind of searches did she do for that a lot of google search a lot of um, I don't know how specifically she does plant related but She mentioned once how to kill characters, like if you're writing stories, you could actually look up something like that and she'd get ideas from it. Um, Did you guys do these searches together? No, she happened to mention it. So she told you that she was doing these searches? Yeah. So tell me, what would she talk about? What would she say? about this website that she'd found on like how to kill characters and then she was mentioning like cyanide was a popular one and oh gosh can't remember what else but similar things um she mentioned once insulin, like to see if she could shoot somebody with insulin, because if you have too much, it would do something. I can't remember, but. <sighs> so when she told you this, what did you say? Other than it was disturbing and kind of creepy, um, <laughs> No, I was quite uncomfortable with it, mm -hmm. I mean. Well, obviously, Rachel, you guys got to the point where something was agreed upon. When yeah. was that? And I want you to be truthful with me. I've been pretty nice with you, but I want you to be truthful about everything because we're done with with um, anything else. We're, getting, we're, we're just talking about the truth about what happened. We're here, so we're going to deal with it, okay? Okay. Did you have a dream about them dying, or is that a made-up story? I did, actually, but it was weird with really weird symbology, but we did discuss it as well. You and your mother? Yeah. Okay. So you have a dream about this, you discuss it with your mother, and then that's when the talks get started, Is am I correct? Is that when the talks get started of finding some way to poison them? Yeah. Okay. And why did you, and by poisoning them, the intent was to kill them. Is that correct? Okay. Now, Neil was a pretty kick-ass detective, I'm just going to say, because he clearly knew exactly what to say and do to make a person feel comfortable enough to just, like, spill their guts. So then he asked her point blank why they did it. 
And up to that point, she had kept to the original story that it wasn't her doing. But without even realizing it, she answered in a way that proved that she was far more guilty than she was trying to play. Why did you guys want to kill them? My dad, when he gets angry, he was very hard to deal with. He would throw things. He would be very unreasonable with the weirdest things. Like the fact that I wanted a job and he couldn't get one, or just really stupid things. <laughs> and really, I was a bit scared of him, but. I don't know, it was... I couldn't really see him ever, like, doing anything to help us. He was always just... blowing money, he would... <laughs> always be out of the house. Wouldn't really help around the house. Sean... I accepted that she wanted him gone, but I really didn't <laughs> think he was necessary. God. And I really actually wasn't aware that she was getting Sarah. I knew about Sean, I knew about Dad, but I didn't know she was going to go ahead with Sarah. She didn't tell me anything. <laughs> After that, Neil went on to ask her about her computer searches, and at first she claimed that she didn't search anything relating to the situation, but he told her that she needed to be truthful and that it was going to come out one way or another, which led Rachel to reveal more. Was it discussed that they would, you guys would kill your dad first and then Sean, or how was it gonna go? Dad and then Sean. Dad and then Sean. And you said you guys did research on the internet on types of poisons that could not be detectable if you weren't looking for them or they would be difficult to find. And you talked about poisonous plants and cyanide. What else? Oh, jeez. I didn't think specifically there was much else. Because mainly she was looking for poison. She was looking for poison. Mm -hmm on these internet searches, Google searches. Did you do any searches? No. We have your computer. What are we gonna find on your computer? You need to be honest about everything. Okay. I don't, I wanna sit here and be decent with you. You gotta tell me everything though, okay? We're gonna find it. It's better for you to, this is your chance, Rachel. Some mistakes were made, obviously. You guys didn't make the best decisions, but we're here now, and now's the time to deal with it. Because there's stuff that we already know, there's stuff that we're gonna know, there's stuff we need to know, and we need to get this all done right now. Okay. What kind of searches did you do? Death-related in general. Death-related in general. Specifically, I can't remember, but if you pull up the thing, I'll remember, because <laughs> I can't remember specifically. Okay, but in death in general, I mean, what does that mean? How to kill someone. How to kill someone. Okay, so when you're looking up how to kill someone, what what did you come up with? Um, oh jeez. Tylenol, suffocation. I can't remember exactly. There's a lot of browsing. Um, you did these searches from your laptop? Your your laptop? Because I know there were several over there. That, that these were on your laptop that you did these searches? Is that yes? Okay. And you said they were Google searches? Mm -hmm. What would you type into Google? Um, I'm trying to remember how to... 
mostly things that started with a how to, how to kill someone, how to, um, there are probably specific ones on like plants, um, nightshade, what not. I can't remember. Both Diane and Rachel had been searching all different types of ways to kill someone on their shared laptop, such as herbs that cause strokes, where to purchase rat poisoning, and essential oils that can lead to death. I mean, you name it. The Google was Googling. And apparently, they didn't mourn the loss of Mark for long because they also looked up lethal doses for adults weighing 48 kilograms shortly after he died, which, by the way, was just one kilogram different from what Sean weighed when he died. Rachel went on to say that in their old house where Mark died, her mom would hide the antifreeze in a turkey baster under the kitchen sink, where she would then slowly administer a couple inches or so in his drink every day. But she wasn't sure where it was hidden in their new house when it came to Sean and Sarah. And even though I feel like she basically admitted guilt earlier when she didn't deny involvement, it wasn't until Neil asked how many times she spiked the drinks that Rachel finally admitted guilt. So, when antifreeze gets there, how, how do you guys go about administering it? Let's see, mom would... I think she got some containers that she would like do like, I don't know if it was turkey baster or whatnot, but to take it from one container into another container, hide it in the house, and then when she would buy drinks, would doctor them. And when you say doctor the drinks, what do you mean by that? Pour out a good like two inches or so and then fill it. With the antifreeze? Yeah. So where did she hide the antifreeze? You said it was she hid it in the house. Okay, so where in the where in the house did she hide it? Oh, I know in the old house she had it under the sink, but in a turkey I, baster, you said. Yeah, I'm not sure where she would have it in the new one because the only thing that was under the sink in the new house was cat food. So I don't know where you don't she know was where she was keeping putting it. No. Did you ever see the antifreeze? The no. bottles of it. You never in the saw old it? house I did, you but did. not, not in the new house. Because there was a bottle of antifreeze right out in the open in the garage for anybody and their brother to see at your house. Okay. You're saying you never saw that bottle? I wasn't aware of it there, but... Okay. So you're saying that at the old house you knew she kept it in a turkey baster under the sink. And when she would, your quote is, when she was doctoring the drinks, she would pour some of the drink out and then she would put the antifreeze in the drink and then give it to your father? Mm -hmm. How often did you do that? Um, once. Only once? How many times did you do it, Rachel? Three, four times. It was a trade-off. She would do it, then I would. And what would you put the antifreeze in? What kind of drinks? Coke. You put it in Coke? Mm-hmm. And what'd your mom put it in? Gatorade. How often did you do this? Like once a day. Once a day? For how long? Um. Several weeks. Several weeks? Mm -hmm. How much would you put in? Not much, just like, um, say you have like that size of Coke bottle, that much. Okay. Would you do it once a day and your mother do it once a day, or would you do it once a day? How would that, I mean, how would that work out? Whoever was there. <laughs> So whoever was there, so it could have been done multiple times a day. Yeah. Did it happen multiple times a day? Probably, yeah. At first she said it happened once a day, but she eventually admitted to doing it twice every day, filling the Coke bottle up about two inches with antifreeze once in the morning and once at night, and that her mom would also do it in the afternoon. I mean, sick, 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 sick.
She said that her sister, Sarah, was in on the discussion of poisoning their father, but that she did not knowingly give him any of the drinks. Rather, her mom would give her a spiked drink and say, hey, give this to your dad, again, with Sarah having no idea that it was actually spiked. She said they went through five bottles in total of antifreeze when killing her dad, which that detail went against what her mom said. Her mom had said that she only would put in a few teaspoons or so in his drink, but Rachel said that towards the very end of her dad's life, her mom was literally filling up the Coke bottles halfway with antifreeze, which is roughly 36 teaspoons of antifreeze, okay guys? Rachel then finally admitted, after a lot of probing, that she also spiked her sister's drinks. After that, she was then taken into custody. The following day, after more evidence was found, Neil spoke with her again and asked why they decided to take Sarah to the hospital instead of just letting her die at home. And Rachel's response literally left me speechless. And where did you guys keep the antifreeze? Mom would keep moving it around, but if I asked her for it, she would get me some in a small container so I could use it. Okay. Did you guys ever use anything else besides antifreeze? I know I didn't. I don't know if Mom did or not. Okay. So, but from what you understand, it was all, you guys were only using the antifreeze? Yeah, okay. from what I knew. Okay. Let me ask you this, why did you guys, because I've spoken to your mom about this, and I'd like to know why you guys eventually took, you know, when Sarah got so bad, I know you guys said you thought that she was pretty much dead, but why did you take her to the hospital? I didn't want another one to die in the house. And why is that? Because houses are nasty after somebody's died in it. Okay, and what does that mean? What do you mean, what do you mean by that? I get a lot of nightmares. Like after Sean died, I moved into his room and it was awful, awful, awful in there. I kept feeling things in there. I just didn't want that again. Okay. So you didn't want her to die in the house? Mm -hmm. And you guys, it, it explain to me why you waited to the point you did to bring her to the hospital? Was it just, just like you said, you just didn't want her to die in the house? Did yeah. you, did you want her to die in the hospital instead? Yeah. Okay. Your mom had said something to me about you guys didn't want her to die in the house because of kind of a ghost experience. Is that kind of what you're talking about when you say you get these feelings? Yeah. And you didn't want that again? No. Okay. Were you surprised when you found out that Sarah was going to live? Very. Very surprised? And how did, what did you think about that then whenever you found that out? A bit surprised, but then just like, okay, so she's going to live. Had you and your mom talked about what was going to happen since she was going to live? We're thinking about places we could, like, put our, like, housing things, depending on how bad the brain damage was. Um, Were there any more discussions of finishing, finishing her off? Didn't really get to. Never, never got to those discussions? Although we did talk about the likelihood of her still dying, I mean, like, if something just happened, like, I don't know, a bleed out or something medical. Okay, so you guys were still talking about the potential for her dying? Yeah. Were you guys going to do anything to help, help that process along? I'd be more content to just whatever happens, happens. I don't know. But honestly, after reading her diary, her response really isn't that surprising. Rachel wrote in her journal the day after her brother died, saying, Yet I feel your gaze linger over me. I close my eyes and try not to think of the ghosts of copper and bleach on my tongue. I try not to think of shuddery breaths or how easily a soul evaporates, leaving nothing behind but a hollow husk curled up on the floor, eyes vacant and dull arms extended, 
But what were you reaching for? I mean, I gotta tell you, these journal entries are just like giving me the chills. So Neil went on to ask her about a new journal entry that was found after she got arrested that was in her purse. The journal entry talked about feeling bad about what she did to her sister and the pain that she put her through. But Rachel's response was more self-centered rather than guilt. And, and let me ask you, uh, while we're on the topic of journal stuff, I guess, you know, after we arrested you, when we had to search your purse, you know, we found your new journal entry, some of the stuff that you'd written in there, and I've got some of that talking about how you felt, you know, kind of bad uh, about Sarah's pain because you helped basically put her in the position she was and um so did you feel bad then because you, you wrote that you felt a little bit bad about knowing that you helped put her in that much pain so did you feel kind of bad about that or it's harder when you're watching in the er she would scream out i don't like screaming okay so that that was harder it would have just been easier for you if she just would have died and not having to see all that? Yeah. Okay. And then you wrote a little poem at the end of that. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. How did that poem go? I read about the nurses a little bit. Right. And it's like, they make you feel stupid. Mm -hmm. You remember at the very end of that writing what you wrote about? Then he brought up a poem that she put at the end of the entry, which read, Once upon a time there was six, and now there are three. Only the quiet ones are left, my mom, my little sister, and me. And she admitted to writing that while her sister was still alive on the ICU floor. Now, she then went on to say that she would only have regretted taking her to the hospital sooner had it been a little less painful for Sarah, but that either way, she still wanted her to die and essentially was shocked and disappointed that she didn't. Then, after some more conversation and probing questions, Rachel admitted that her and her mom's plan was to kill her little sister, Brianna, last. And when asked why they did it all, Rachel said that the reason behind her dad's murder was for peace. Her brother's was due to him being annoying, Sarah was nosy, and Brianna was because Rachel knew she wouldn't have been able to take care of her because she couldn't even take care of herself. And she assumed that her mom wanted Brianna dead because she considered her a burden. I know, it's crazy. This was a lot for me to even process because they just talk about it so casual, so cavalier. I mean, it's very difficult to wrap your mind around. I mean, how could someone feel this way about their family, let alone a mom and daughter teaming up the way that Diane and Rachel did? And for what? Peace? I think the craziest thing about all of it, okay, well, maybe not the craziest thing because let's face it, this whole case is crazy, but during the interrogation, Rachel talked about how she and her mom never talked about what would happen if they got caught. Rachel said that she only worried about possibly ending up on a crime show if she ever went to court. There was literally zero remorse whatsoever from her about the deaths that she helped cause. So Rachel and Diane were both arrested after their confessions, and they were charged with one count of assault for Sarah and two counts of first-degree murder for Mark and Sean. And sadly, Brianna was put into foster care because she no longer had any parents or family to take care of her. Now, the next thing was for Neil to figure out whether or not Sarah had any sort of knowledge of the anti-freeze plan and if she played an active role in her dad and her brother's deaths. It seemed unlikely that Sarah knew, being that she herself was poisoned, but 
he still had to look into it. I mean, had she known what was going on, she probably would have known the warning signs and what the drinks looked like that she needed to avoid that were in the refrigerator. Not to mention that Rachel lied quite a bit throughout her investigation to try to get out of things. So I don't know if she was really telling the truth about her sister's involvement. Maybe this was just another way that she was trying to act like a vile monster. I don't know trying to throw her sister under the bus after attempting to kill her, who knows? But Neil decided he needed to speak with Sarah about what had been going on. Now at that point, Sarah was recovering, but she was far from any type of full recovery, if ever again. She was literally having to relearn how to walk, how to talk, and how to do basic life things all over again. She suffered a great deal of neurological damage as well as critical organ damage. So going into the situation, Neil knew that speaking with her and getting down to the truth was not going to be easy and he had to tread very lightly. So when Neil went to talk to Sarah, she seemed really out of it, which after spending almost two weeks in the ICU from antifreeze, that's pretty understandable. But when Neil started talking to her, it was pretty clear that she wasn't in the best state of mind to give clear answers. It seemed like Sarah was in a haze. Her jumbled answers were not due to her trying to figure out a lie or how to get herself out of the situation like her mom and sisters did. She was clearly suffering from neurological effects after being poisoned by her family. Brain damage from antifreeze is very serious and oftentimes permanent. It can cause overall decreased mental functioning, blindness, memory issues, and a ton of more awful symptoms. It's also been known to be very similar to Parkinson's disease. Neil asked Sarah about the possibility that her sister and mom told him that she was involved too. But again, Sarah's response was so vague and jumbled together. I mean, Sarah did know enough to remember reading about what was going on in a journal, but I'm not sure when she read the journal. It could have been more recently after her dad and brother died. I don't know. To me, Sarah seemed so out of it because of the effects of antifreeze, but even so, it didn't seem like she played any part in the actual spiking of her dad and brother's drink. So Rachel was the first one to face the music at the pre-trial hearing on May 5th, 2015. And for someone awaiting her life or death fate, she seemed pretty relaxed, even laughing at one point. But when it came time to stand before the judge, that's when she began to cry as she entered a plea agreement where she pled guilty to her two second degree murder charges and one charge of armed criminal action and one count of first degree assault. The prosecutor on the case, Dan Patterson, not only reiterated what happened, but he also read to the judge the poem that she wrote while her sister was deathly ill but still alive. The one that said, only the quiet ones will be left, my mother, my little sister, and me. So being that there was no denying what was already on record, Rachel entered the plea deal to avoid being sentenced to death. Instead, she agreed to serve two back-to-back -back life sentences on top of two back-to-back 20-year -back sentences. At first, she had been charged with two counts of first-degree murder, but because she was admitting her guilt and was willing to give testimony against her mom if her case ever went to trial, her first-degree charges were dropped to second-degree charges. Another agreement with her plea deal was that Rachel claimed that she actually didn't want to harm her brother and sister. She only did it because her mom wanted her to do it. Just a few months after Rachel's hearing on July 30th, 2015, it was Diane's turn to enter the courtroom. But this time, it wasn't as simple as it was for Rachel, who basically just was in and out. Diane's attorney tried to block key evidence from going to trial, such as her interview with Neil, where one of the first things she said was, will I need a lawyer? Her team also tried to eliminate the search warrant that was used to search her home and find things such as the antifreeze bottle and Rachel's journal. Diane's attorney felt that during the interview, Diane had asked for a lawyer at least twice. But Neil, who testified that day in court, said that actually Diane never asked for a lawyer, but rather just asked if she needed one. She didn't demand to have one. So her attorney also played one of the clips of the interview where Diane wasn't admitting what she did and omitted the other parts where she admitted her guilt. And when Neil was asked to give a summary of his interview with Diane, he said, she's telling me she poisoned her family. It doesn't get much more clear than that. So simple, crystal clear, black, white, open, shut, case, all the analogies, all the cliches, all the things. So Neil's second interview with Diane after she was arrested and put 
put in jail was also brought up, and he was pressed by her attorney over whether or not she asked for a lawyer and was denied. In the interview, Diane said, one question I do have is, when do I get to have a lawyer? I'm willing to talk to you, but I need to get a lawyer. So after asking for clarification from Diane, Neil asked, you are still willing to talk with me without a lawyer? And Diane and Neil continued their conversation. Diane's attorney tried to push Neil on why he didn't get Diane a lawyer since she kept bringing it up. But Neil said because he clarified it with her several times and she continued talking. So basically it seemed like she was okay with this arrangement. So he continued talking and she didn't stop him. Then finally, it was Diane's turn to get her fate handed to her. The state's plan was to try and get the death sentence for her because there was enough incriminating evidence that could have easily qualified her for capital punishment. I mean, she admitted to it all and she said how she did it and her reason for doing it and all of those things and how it was for more peace in her life. So. I mean, clearly, again, the evidence is there. She was a monster, and her and her team knew that the evidence was pretty compelling, which led Diane to entering an Alford plea. And this was on January 21st, 2016. Now, this basically says that she acknowledges that there was enough evidence for her to be convicted without admitting guilt. Sarah gave a victim impact statement at court. And in this, she said, I forgive mom for what she did to me. Not only did she take away my dad and brother, she also took away my livelihood and my independence. I prefer to be a survivor than a victim. Now, similar to her daughter, Rachel, because Diane pleaded guilty, she got out of the possibility of a death sentence and agreed to carry out three life sentences with no possibility of parole. Sarah was relieved with her mother's outcome and she said that she did forgive her mom, saying, I'm a Christian and I believe forgiveness is the only way to go. So although Rachel had entered a plea deal the year prior, her sentencing wasn't until March of 2016. Now, during which she apologized to her sister, Sarah, with a very lengthy letter that she read, part of it, which said, I'm sorry I couldn't find the courage to stand up for what was right, to go for help, to protect you and our siblings. Your suffering could have been prevented and I hate myself for not being there for you. I want you to know that you are an inspiration to me. Well, Rachel ended up being sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 42 and a half years. Diane was officially given her life sentence without the possibility of parole in 2018. As for Sarah, unfortunately, she will never be able to fully recover from what her mother and sister did to her. She will live in an assisted care facility forever due to the long-term effects that she sustained from the antifreeze. Sarah feels pretty alone and angry with her mom and sister. That news came a bit late for Sarah. Still, she's learned to accept her new reality, living in an assisted care facility, more alone than ever. Do you still consider them family? Not anymore. I consider them as killers who hate me. You're angry. I just felt like I want to slap both of them and calling them B-words. And it was never able to be proven whether or not Sarah was involved in any of the killings regarding her brother and her dad. But in a more recent 2022 interview, she talked about how she knew about the killings after finding her mom's journal where Diane wrote about all three of them dying. Sarah said when she confronted her mom about it, her mom said not to worry, that she wouldn't die, and that she shouldn't be reading her journal anyway. But according to Neil, there is really no real way to know for sure about Sarah's involvement or lack of involvement with the murders due to, again, the long-term effects of antifreeze. On Facebook, Sarah wrote that she has PTSD because of everything that she went through, which honestly doesn't surprise me in the least. Now, I wasn't able to find a ton of updates on Brianna. At the time when everything went down, she was placed into foster care. So she would be an adult now, and hopefully she has been able to find ways to cope with everything that she went through and can still have a relationship with her sister, Sarah, at the very least. Diane, actually, though, did a very big interview with ABC's 2020 last year while she was in prison. And she talked about her children fondly, which was a far cry from the way she was talking about them almost a decade earlier with the detective, even referring to one of her children as a pest, if you remember. She talked about how raising her kids were the good old days, saying that that time of her life was a really good time for her. She went on to say that although her husband started out as a pretty good guy, he eventually turned to drinking, and she alluded to him possibly getting involved in drugs due to a friend group that he was hanging out with, not his band 
bandmates, but apparently another group of friends that seemed to live like a fast lifestyle, according to Diane. But Diane claimed that she was essentially innocent in her husband's death, saying, and I quote, I said what I was going to say. I'm saying there's more to that than what people know. Mark was with some very dangerous people. People have disappeared. I was told in jail that Mark had been green lighted. I'm saying somebody probably came in and gave him something. Now, the term green lighted basically means when someone has a hit out on them. But the thing is, back in 2013 and even in the years after that, Diane never mentioned anything about the people that her husband was hanging out with, bad people who would be considered dangerous and would put a hit out on him. And not for nothing, but like, what's the likelihood that somebody put a hit out on him and it was the same method of murder that you were using on your son and tried to use with your daughter. She was also asked about how she felt about the fact that Sarah was still going through the aftermath of all of her antics with the antifreeze and all of that and was very hurt by her own mom. And Diane said to that, I'm sorry for what she went through, but you know, I'm sorry for what everybody goes through. I'm sorry for what I've had to go through. I mean, again, Diane was clearly heartless about trying to kill her own daughter and even said that she wouldn't rule out herself possibly being poisoned. Which yes, you heard that right. Diane went from full on admitting what she did to her family back in 2013 to now acting like she had no part in it. And maybe she was even poisoned, which police said that there was absolutely zero evidence of that happening. She said she couldn't say whether or not she was guilty and that she only confessed back in 2013 to save her family because they were being threatened. But by who, you might ask? Well, all she would say was that somebody was threatening them. When she was told that a lot of people would say that her explanation didn't make a lot of sense, she said that a lot of things don't make sense. And as if that wasn't all completely psycho enough for you, Diane completely flipped the switch and said that her son actually did it to himself and that he left a note behind. Authorities said that there was no truth in that either, so she's just like grasping at straws, especially because if there was any truth to it, Diane would have said that during her initial interrogation. She seemed to have no problem disparaging her son, so why would that be any different back then when they were first asking her about it? It makes no sense. Math ain't mathin'. Make it make sense. So then Diane was given a little update on how Sarah was doing, and to say that my jaw dropped when I heard what she had to say, is an absolute understatement. Just watch this. What about Sarah? Sarah is now living in a group home. She's been permanently injured. This is a fairly recent picture of Sarah. Oh wow, she's gained weight. Really? That's what she notices? Now the thing is, I think that people want to see some sort of remorse or shred of humanity from someone like Diane. But when you're dealing with a legitimate psychopath and very possible narcissist, you aren't going to get much. She made the entire interview about herself. This case is beyond shocking in more ways than one. And the most mind-blowing part of it all is that Diane and Rachel, if they had stopped after Mark and possibly even after Sean had died, they would be walking free today. Nobody would suspect anything. The initial autopsies for both men missed the antifreeze completely, so if they wouldn't have gone after Sarah, they would be free women, just working their jobs, attending church, running the music program. Rachel could have even had a family of her own at this point. But because they continued their sick and twisted plan to have peace from their family, they got caught. I guess their plan did work out because they do have peace from the rest of their family, just not exactly in the way that they had planned. They get to sit and rot in prison for many, many years to come. But honestly, it's stomach churning to think that had Sarah not have made it, they would have admittedly went after Brianna next. And it's also sad to think that that's something that Brianna's probably had to come to terms with over the years as well. And it's tragic to think that Sarah's dreams and the plans that she had for her life ended the moment that they placed that first tablespoon of antifreeze in her drink. Sarah had plans to use her French degree that she had worked so hard for abroad and now she's unable to fulfill those dreams. Now she wants to do something to help other people who have been poisoned, such as a support group, perhaps. 
It's also horrible that Mark and Sean's lives were brutally cut short by the people who were supposed to love them the most. I'm so curious as to why Diane involved Rachel back when she first thought about killing her husband. Diane was fully capable of carrying out the plan by herself. It's not like it required any heavy lifting. So I've read that a lot of people think that Diane and Rachel had a severely toxic codependent relationship. And that's not only why Diane went to Rachel, but why Rachel went along with it without question and just did whatever her mom asked her to do. Either way, it's so twisted and makes me wonder if Rachel ever wondered if her mom would eventually turn on her. I mean, she fully planned on wiping everybody else out. So what would stop her from doing the same to Rachel? I guess Rachel knew that she was her mother's golden child and I don't know, just hoped for the best. I mean, this case was crazy, guys, and I can't believe that Diane admitted verbatim to spiking the drinks and is now acting like she played no part in any of it and was possibly a victim herself. It is so, so infuriating. I also don't buy that Rachel felt forced or like she had to go along with it. She was fully capable of doing the right thing, but chose not to. And for what, her dad's car, her brother's bedroom? I mean, really? Her and her mom seem like two peas in a pod and both lack any sort of empathy or emotion. Even when Rachel publicly apologized to Sarah, she cried, but not really, because just like during her interrogation, there were no actual tears. I am curious to know what you guys think of it all, though. Do you think that Rachel should be given the same amount of blame as Diane? And do you think that there was more to the motive than Diane claimed? Do you think that she would have moved on to members outside of the family had she not gotten caught? Or was this just a woman who was sick of her family? I don't know. Make it make sense. It is wild. So thank you guys for tuning in. I know that this one was a doozy, like I said, but I am curious to know your thoughts. And what the real motive was here and why the mom and daughter duo would think that this would be a good plan, a good idea. I don't know. It, my head's spinning. Rachel says that you were poisoning and killing your own family, that you might have even poisoned Brianna before it was all over. No. Were you going to? No. How are we supposed to believe that? I don't know. What is the truth, Diane? The truth is out there. <laughs>